Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Ryan Olson. I lead product design for the data center robotics team at Meta. And I'm joined by Victor Escobedo, who runs uh, governments, governance, risk, and compliance for data center security at Google, as well as Evan Johnson, who leads data center automation at Microsoft. And today we want to talk about how robotic physical uh, manipulation is being used to address some of the common challenges between hyperscalers. So I was reading a recent uh, industry report that said that in primary markets, um, data, watt data center capacity per megawatt is up about 24% 24, 24 year over year, and construction is up nearly 70%. And that's just being held back by power availability and lead times in electrical infrastructure. So the hyperscalers, hyperscalers such as Google, Microsoft, and Meta have very ambitious near-term scaling goals that are driven by their, the AI-driven uh, research and products that, that they're deploying right now. And that's kind of um, balanced out by a very intense focus on efficiency and, and, and uh, sustainability goals, such as Meta's commitment to reach net zero emissions by 2030. Um, all this time, there's also a lot of attention being paid to uh, media management and media sanitization of data bearing devices so that we can keep our uh, customers' data private. And Victor will speak more to that in a couple minutes. So what we're gonna talk about today is how physical automation, which includes robotics, is being used to meet some of these challenges and the opportunity for these technologies to scale even further uh, across the industry. So a lot of this work is happening under the auspices of the data center automation subproject, which is part of the data center facilities OCP project. And that was founded last year by uh, Microsoft, Google, and Meta uh, in an effort to kickstart collaboration around some of these common pain, po pain points. Our goals are to help industry players, uh, help bring them into the conversation and support their product development, um, to advance the state of data center physical automation, and to influence and establish common standards that can help these technologies scale across the industry. We work in four indi individual work streams, which are remote management and, uh, re I'm sorry, remote inspection and monitoring. Um, remote manipulation, media management, and material handling. So I'm gonna turn it over to Evan now, who's gonna speak about the first of those, which is remote monitoring. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning, everybody. So I'll start by talking about remote monitoring and inspection. The purpose of this is that it gives us insight into the conditions in the data center without having to physically be there. By deploying mobile robots that are outfitted with cameras, it's possible for us to capture real-time video and images of any equipment needing attention. This is a particularly useful use case where technicians and engineers are troubleshooting and they need additional information. Traditionally, they would go through the security checkpoints, they would go into the data hall, they would see the equipment and get, the, get that information. Are the LEDs flashing? Was this cabled correctly? But using this mobile robot system, are able to issue a command, have the robot drive to the equipment, where it then captures an image, captures video, and transmits it directly back to the team without anyone needing to enter that secured zone. We can take this same technology and apply it to a slightly different use case. If we capture images and location data of every deployed asset in the data center, we can use that to support our uh, physical auditing and potentially take that physical audit into a virtual audit. Now, our sensing needs extend beyond just seeing. We wanna capture other data. We wanna know things like what's the temperature, humidity, how's the air quality, what's the Wi-Fi signal strength. We take that information and gives us additional insight into what's happening in this data centers. A, use, a success story that Microsoft has seen here is that we were capturing air particulate data. We saw localized, uh, localized spikes during wildfire season. That enabled us to do some target, uh, targeted condition-based maintenance on the air filtration system, uh, which we wouldn't have had the insight to do that without our mobile robot systems. And I, I know there's the argument, like you could deploy static sensors and do this with static sensors, but that is hundreds or thousands of devices that need to be deployed and managed. 
By using robots, we are significantly reducing the amount of gear that needs to be deployed. You can have a small fleet of robots that have a set of sensors on them and deploy just that small fleet. Uh, of course, they need to be managed, but it also gives you the opportunity to upgrade that over time. We are doing temperature and humidity today. We want to do Wi-Fi signal strength in the future. We can add an additional sensor onto the robot and then you know, commission that, and, and now we have you know, additional, additional capabilities out in the field. I can't talk about mobile robots without talking about the core challenges of them, though, which is navigation, like, especially in a data center environment where it's pretty featureless. It's a bunch of empty hallways where if we, any of us were blindfolded and dropped into the middle, we wouldn't know where we were. And the robot uses you know, LIDAR and cameras and is down on the ground. It doesn't see as well as we do, so it's, it's even harder. So what this means is that the quality of the mapping that we do up front is critical to the success of these robots. And then if we're reconfiguring data centers, we need to continue to update these maps and do, do maintenance and manage these maps so that we can continue to see success with the robot systems. Now, if we have mobile robots that are performing these, in, these remote inspections, they're kind of our eyes in the field. Now, how do we get hands out there? And that's where we see remote manipulation being a really useful use really interesting use case. And the biggest reason to pursue this is pretty simple. It's our people. Data centers, you know, they're loud, they're hot, requires PPE, potentially we're looking at you know, needing uh, exposure, exposure limits and monitoring. If we can do tasks remotely using automation without ever needing people to go into that part of the data center, we then completely remove them from that exposure. So we can imagine a future where we can remotely service devices, you know, we can do reseeding cables, maybe replacing storage devices, replacing servers that need in-depth investigation. And as these data centers grow larger and devices become more complex, we can use this technology to support our on-site technicians to meet our service and availability requirements. Now, challenges here, you know, even the best maintained racks are visually chaotic. And so this is challenging for this is challenging for machine vision when you look at this rack and you're trying to find a target. Maybe there's something in the way, maybe there's not. What's your confidence level that you found the right target? Let's assume that we did find the right target. Now we reach out to go interface with this equipment, but it's designed for a human hand. Very dexterous. Automation just isn't there right now. So we need to work together to develop uh, standard set of you know, standard interfaces that work for both humans and automation. You know, think of the data, the data center and the automation as a system together and how do they work together. So when we see things like pull rings on QSFP connectors, the latches on Ethernet cables, uh, the spring-loaded server retention latches, all of those things that look very simple for us to do with our hands but are really challenging for automation. So I had mentioned a use case of uh, re replacing managing storage devices. We've done a little bit of work in our labs using off-the-shelf equipment to remove and replace E1.S SSDs to you know, some, some success. It's possible. That's what we found. And there were some reasons why we thought that this was something that was worth going after. One, the SSDs are on the front panel. They're accessible. We can grip, remove, reposition, regrip. And then also they're hot swappable, so we don't have to touch anything else. But, like I said, it's possible. There's other improvements that need to be made. If we think of the IT equipment and the automation working together as a system, and we co-develop this, we can add in features into the IT equipment that make automation better. So an, an opportunity here would be you know, like putting a lead in or a self-alignment feature so that when the SSD starts to be pushed in, the automation doesn't have to be top dead center and very accurate. It takes away some of the requirements from the automation. It makes the system overall better and improves the cycle time. Now, what's the next step? So it's possible if we were to deploy something like this, we'd take these SSDs, we'd then put them into a uh, secure container that would go to some sort of, uh, I don't know, downstream media destruction process, something like that. But I'll hand it over to Victor at this point to talk about media management. Thanks, Alex. 
Okay, so Evan and Ryan both kind of alluded to the fact that there's a lot of really interesting use cases for introducing industrial automation uh, within our kind of hyperscaled environments. But I want to take this moment, just pause a little bit and kind of talk about with media management specifically, kind of focus on the why it matters, you know, for the industry as a whole, but also for um, this kind of unique impacts that we have and we see within our, within our hyperscale uh, spaces. So first is just kind of the scale of the operations, right? Not, not just the number of like assets that we're managing, but the global footprint of the data centers that we have to kind of operate in, right? You have to think about the processes, the people, the technology across that global footprint and ensure that you have highly reliable, highly in, uh, high integrity processes, technology um, that work across all of that. It's really difficult with the variance of all, all the technology and the constant move. Um, so it's, it's really important that this, this creates a lot of complexity in our spaces. But you kind of look at that and you would assume that media management obviously is going to be very critical. You would expect that there would be a lot of research already done as to why this is so important for companies like ours to really get this right. But when we kind of dug into this, what we found is that existing literature kind of has an industry benchmark of around $5 million for a loss event here, which we understand is just kind of a gross underestimate for organizations of our size, right? The, the scrutiny that we have, the, the public kind of visibility, um, and the types of debt sensitive data that we manage. Um, and so we, we believe that this is off by at least an order of magnitude, probably more. Um, <clears throat> and when we dug into this research, what we found is that, you know, we're really not the target audience of, of those benchmarks, right? The target audience is kind of the industry as an average, um, which tends to kind of throw out outliers. And in our case, like we happen to be outliers. Um, so we, we are purposely not targets. So we're really kind of encouraging kind of more research in this space, um, thinking about how we can have benchmarks that make sense for kind of these hyperscaled environments um, so that we can really pre present kind of ROI cases that make sense to the business for investing in the types of industrial kind of automation that we, we kind of talked about already. Um, and we want to specifically call out that any of these benchmarks should take in into account more than just the financial impact, right, of, of losing this, the regulatory kind of monetary impact, the fines, um, but also take into account things like the reputational impact um, and the operational impact, right, disrupting operations, the kind of incident management process that has to go on um, in the kind of weeks or months of work that, that you have to do after that um, to really kind of have an entire end-to-end -end view um, to provide the kind of estimate that is needed for the business to kind of do this right. And so, um, this is an area that, that our subgroup is actually specifically working on, um, and we're hoping that we, through OCP, we can actually kind of put something forward um, to kind of help fill this gap. But in the meantime, we're also looking for kind of collaboration, if this is an area that's, that's uh, a focus area for anyone in industry, um, to really kind of help kind of fill, uh, fill this going forward. And so now that kind of we understand a little bit of the why uh, media management matters, we already alluded to the fact that the chain of custody and non-repudiation can dramatically increase by introducing industrial automation into, into the media management process, right? And so what we've seen is, is going from um, having targets of maybe two to maybe three nines if it's human-based human processes um, to really, you know, five nines and above um, for, for the types of operations that we're talking about, um, which really kind of puts us in, into a place where we feel like we can have better, better risk conversations with our leaders. But it's also important to know that um, we don't just focus on security and privacy, and we're actually seeing benefits here um, for efficiency, right? So all of the media that we're talking about, right, you, you can reduce the amount of human touches that's needed across the entire chain. Um, and so the systems on the, on the right here on the picture, um, some of these were shown at the keynote uh, yesterday that, that Google demonstrated, but the, the tote at the bottom is something you can see in the, in the village. We've kind of alluded to a couple of times for actually kind of standardizing and supporting the various kinds of media that, that are in our fleet. Um, the system above actually automatically does, you know, uh, s automatic scanning, uh, uh, inventorying, record, record keeping, and uh, processing of all of that media. Um, so again, without any human touch. Um, and we also kind of combine this with like AGVs and everything upstream, right? So you can imagine an entire system where, where no human is involved across that entire thing. So you really get some operational efficiencies. Second, we also see improvements around worker safety, right? So specifically, um, managing all this media requires really, really highly repetitive tasks. Um, and so we see a lot of like injury concerns, right, that we, that we have in our spaces. And so you can prevent the high, highly repetitive tasks like um, high volume barcode scanning, right? High volume lifting and high volume sorting. Um, you can kind of completely remove those uh, from, from the worker's um, uh, set of tasks. And finally, um, as Evan alluded to, the ability to leverage these systems for kind of at scale global evidence gathering uh, for audits and for our own internal assurance exercises, right? So being able to have, you know, data driven um, uh, signals and that are super, uh, super reliable and of high integrity um, that you can kind of provide centralized, again, have, have that assurance and then provide to your customers or internal auditors um, to ensure that you're doing this um, properly. 
but ag again, it's not all, all rainbows and unicorns, right? There are actual challenges in deploying these, um, and so we want to talk about some of those. And, and the first is around standardization, um, specifically around labeling, right? So with all the various media that we have out there, we have different designs of labels, different sizes, different positions. Um, all, all of this makes vision systems and, and kind of targeting of these things much more difficult. Um, and you combine that with the variance that we see in package design um, across generations of the same media from the same supplier and across kind of different suppliers and, and, and vendors. Um, and so the combination of these two really pose come some problems uh, for introducing industrial automation and being able to handle it at the scales that we're talking about. And then finally, like in our journey at Google kind of deploying these systems, one of the things we found that was a little bit unexpected um, was actually seeing deviations or inconsistencies between what was presented on the labels themselves and what the device itself was reporting uh, electronically to the system. So for example, you have a hard drive and it says that it's, uh, the label says that it's serial number is ABC1234. You plug that system in or you plug the device in and the system tells you that no, it's telling it the serial number is BC1234, right? Seems really obvious, but we actually find these things at our scale pretty regularly, um, which makes it really hard to scale these types of systems out, right? Um, th these kinds of things are, are things you have to handle one-off. We tend not to have the, the luxury of time to go and investigate them at, at full cost. So what that ends up leading to is kind of the premature destruction of some of this media because we don't have the ability to, to reconcile those issues. And so we, we don't think any of these things are actually like insurmountable. We're working um, across industry, across our partners. We really think that there's all of this is, is solvable. Um, we're kind of excited for the future of this, but, but they are real challenges today. Um, and I, I mentioned the premature destruction of, of media. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of the, the goals of, of circular economy around data bearing devices. Um, there's been prior white papers published through OCP around um, kind of the estimates of approximately 90% of hard drives um, that are in use today are getting destroyed after their first use. Right? And so we're seeing a lot of talk and, and a lot of uh, movement towards moving to logical sanitization versus physical uh, destruction of devices. Um, but as we kind of mentioned, we, we really need to solve some of these broader issues upstream um, to, to be able to demonstrate that these technologies actually work, right? So the, you have to have 100% coverage of your entire media that are using the types of logical sanitization um, that, that are kind of slowly kind of making their way into the field. And you have to still be able to sort the clean versus dirty, right? So there are going to be systems where that logical sanitization fails. You have to be able to identify that at an asset level, sort it out, and then still physically destroy when, when that logical sanitization doesn't work. So all the problems we, we kind of highlighted before are, are still going to come up. Um, and so we, we really want to partner with industry here, right, to help kind of figure out how we can demonstrate the, the, the provability of, of those things at the, at the scales that we need. Um, we want to kind of work on the ROI gap that we saw. Um, and then specifically around the, the standardization to really kind of deploy and, and get the kind of industrial systems that we're talking about here um, out at scale. And so overall, we think that there's a huge opportunity to, to really dramatically improve kind of the sustainability goals around carbon reduction. Um, and, and we're looking forward to kind of working across the industry to make that happen. So um, I'll hand it back to Ryan now to close it out. Thanks, Victor. So um, we want to work with industry experts uh, to support the development of physical automation technologies that can scale across the industry. Um, in particular, we're interested in leveraging these technologies in ways that enhance efficiency and safety. So uh, also in particular, we, need, we wanna pay attention to standards, um, which can help, uh, w which are geared towards automation-friendly design. Um, one of the ex examples of these is what Victor mentioned about uh, labeling and packaging of uh, storage media, for example. So if you're a company that's working on these kinds of problems and you want to collaborate, please reach out to the Data Center Automation Project at the email address shown here. And these are the, uh, the, the leads from each of our com companies. And uh, we want to thank OCP for the t giving us the time to speak to those of you who came to, 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 to come see us, and uh, please enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you.